true story, just heard mm -hmm. two days ago from a lady. She had a diagnostic colonoscopy. Through her insurance, she ended up paying $3,000 because that was her deductible. If she paid cash, she would have spent $1,200. Like it was cheaper and more affordable to pay cash that fascinating? than to go use her insurance, which is not, and she spent the, literally, <laughs> this is probably worst case scenario. I'm not sure every insurance company is like this or like hospitals yeah. like this. She spent eight hours, she checked in at 6 a.m. She didn't get the procedure done until 6 p.m. that night. When she paid cash, she got in, had a 90 minute visit and, and procedure left had in his $1,200. It was half the price. She had better service and she left there. So it's like insurance doesn't guarantee care or that you're going to spend less. Welcome everybody to the bend and sway show. We've got another special guest, Matt Dinsmore with direct primary care. We're going to talk a little bit about health care. So, uh, Matt's got some things that he's been working on. Um, and we're going to have you introduce yourself, talk a little about who you are, and okay. then let's talk a little bit about what you're doing with direct primary care. Okay. Yeah. Well, as you said, I'm Matt Dinsmore. I'm a nurse practitioner with uh, direct primary care and uh, I'm locally kind of uh, raised here in Nine Mile Falls and Lakeside and i uh, got my undergraduate and graduate from WSU, so kind of... Very cool. Uh, Go Cougs. Yes, yeah. I served uh, four and a half years in a rural community in Nine Falls as a nurse practitioner there in kind of the insurance billing world. And uh, I was kind of through there that I began to recognize that we have a pretty broken system, both for the patients and yeah. um, for providers. And, uh, and that's when I got exposed to kind of this new model, which is called direct primary care. And mm -hmm. we named ourselves after it, which is a bit confusing now, but mm -hmm. uh, there's about 1,200, 1,500 clinics um, nationwide doing this model, and we're kind of the Spokane version of it. Yeah. So let's, uh, just for those that don't know, yeah. talk a little bit about what is a nurse practitioner. Sure. And Because uh, I, I know what it is, yeah. um, but a lot of people don't realize the difference between being a a nurse versus being a nurse practitioner. Sure. What are the differences and just kind of explain a little bit more about what it takes to become one okay. and what you can do as a nurse practitioner. Sure. Okay. Well, the education level of a nurse practitioner is typically a master's degree. Mm -hmm. uh, it is moving where they're going to require a PhD for that. Uh, and I guess in most simple terms, nurses follow orders while still having the ability to do assessments and reassess patients, mm -hmm. where nurse practitioners uh, can do that as well. However, uh, in the state of Washington, we're also given the liberty to write prescriptions and order labs and order imaging and place referrals. Uh, so we have the, and, and open up a clinic without the yeah. oversight of an MD in Washington. So we're pretty liberal in regards to the practice rights we have. So very similar to a doctor, however, we don't have the years of education. Our practicum is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, we're following kind of the same uh, evidence-based medicine. There's mm -hmm. maybe some surgeries we can't perform that doctors mm -hmm. can. So there's kind of, you'll see, we can be in specialized uh, clinics in family medicine and, and do quite a, quite a bit here in the state of Washington. Yeah, that's very. It's it's a very important distinction because I think a lot of people are confused by it. And it's yeah. I, I think it was. Um, I can't remember if it was Forbes or one of the magazines. It's been one of the top professions um, for the last few years, mm -hmm. anyway, in terms of income opportunity and mm -hmm. the amount of school going into it and all that stuff. Sure. Is that, would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very bright future. Opportunity is huge um, in, in regard and in, in diversity and what you can do within the field, you know. So there's a, uh, you can you can be an administrative, you can be in education, you can be a specialist and mm -hmm. kind of minute, you can be in research. I mean, so there's a lot of opportunity. You're not pigeonhole, pigeonholing yourself with a degree and all for, you know, six plus years of education. So yeah. that's, that's fascinating. So you you spend a master's level getting your education, then you go out and you, you're serving people as a nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. You see the insurance provider patient relationship, and it's actually in the other order, isn't it? You kind of get <laughs> you kind of get the sure. insurance put in the middle. Yeah, sure. Um, and that is, you start to see some cracks in the system, mm -hmm. and that's when you go out and research, and then get with this direct primary care, mm -hmm. name your company after it. Now describe a little bit about direct primary care, what you do, who's your client base, okay. how does that work? So direct primary care, is, it, it's a model of care that doesn't bill insurance. 
So the best the best way to explain it is it's like a gym membership. You know, you okay. pay a monthly membership fee to a gym, and then you can use all the equipment, and you can be on the treadmill, and you're not like charged per mile on the treadmill or something like that, right? right? You just have free access. You can come in during business hours, no extra charging, right? That's how direct primary care works, except with preventative care, primary care, and urgent care. Mm -hmm. So a, a person would pay a monthly membership fee, usually around 50 to $65 a month. And for that, they get unlimited office visits, same day to next day availability. Um, they can call and talk to their provider directly. We also have a HIPAA compliant app that they can text their provider 24 seven. Um, and- that's, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty nice, right? Yeah. Yes. And, and, and realistically, especially as an employer, those numbers are really affordable. Sure, yes. I mean, we you know? say, you know, that like for 70, 90% of the care you'll need in your lifetime, a primary care physician, if they're, if they're working to the maximum of their licensure, should be able to handle that. Because right? most people are relatively healthy. Sure. You know, they're, they're, they don't have a debilitating or life-threatening illness or condition. That's, sure. that's the exception. Mm -hmm. The rule is most people are living a somewhat healthy life. I would say in the United States, a little too sedentary sometimes. <laughs> sure. But I think, um, I think there's, there's some confusion and the system is broken. And I think that, um, you know, I look at insurance for other things, mm -hmm. right? So um, in medical insurance, it's just so different than that. Mm -hmm. And I think it started someplace in a positive way, sure. and I think we've just played add-on and gone different directions with it. Mm -hmm. And so, talk a little bit about direct primary care. Do you work with insurance to overlay that so that somebody, let's say you get a patient not feeling well, um, some stomach problem or something, they sure. think it's you know gastrointestinal, go in and you go, oh, wow, there, there could be something bad here, could yeah. have some sort of cancerous implication, so you have to refer them to sure. oncology, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's a fictitious model, so, you know, we don't have to feel too bad about it, but that person then has, is, has cancer and has to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, on top of the difficult emotional feelings that go with all of that, sure. financial burdens start to mount really quickly. Yeah. So how do you um, work with that model where you, somebody does have a life-threatening or major illness that's gonna cost a lot of money medically, mm -hmm. how, does, how do you interact with that scenario? Uh, well, I don't wanna twist your scenario necessarily, but um, okay, I'll try to stay within your scenario. You can so make up whatever that, you want, but okay. I mean, as, as, as far as like what you can do, and yeah. you, you, you referenced um, going to the limit of your license and yeah. being able to treat people. Let's say we did that, yeah. and we, what do we, we, do reached, we reached our limit and we yeah. need to refer to a specialist. What so, happens then in terms of the, the way that somebody pays for those services going forward? Well, we, we first, we can assess whether, okay, do you have insurance or do you not have insurance, right? And, uh, or a cost sharing network or some other way to pay for a specialist mm -hmm. visit. Now we're gonna do all we can do to try to prevent somebody from seeing a specialist unnecessarily. Right. Which, uh, because primary care is so overloaded, a lot of times primary care physicians, we become punters. Like, okay, you're, you got a knee issue, go to ortho, you got a stomach issue, go to GI. Like, like we don't work up anything anymore. But yeah. if we spend time and in, in ability to be able to work it up, okay, we need to consult with a specialist. So we're gonna take 20 minutes, call, we have, there's like this special back door for providers where we can talk mm -hmm. to an actual GI specialist and say, what would you do for this patient? Yeah. And they say, well, here's Matt, I'm overloaded. Here's some information. This is what I would do. If they don't get better, then send them to me. So we would try to do all we could do to implement that and save them from going to that specialist visit. But let's say they have to go through yeah. there in this GI example. Um, so we could say, okay, well, we're gonna look around and see who has the best cash pay price if they're cash pay, or see if we can help you uh, work some sort of deal. So it turns out there is a provider who does colonoscopies for better than just about any price. And if you need a diagnostic colonoscopy, it's gonna be this much. You know what you're gonna pay wow. right at the time of service. Now, if you go through your insurance, you might have great coverage or something like that. You may know, or you already met your deductible, you're not gonna owe anything more. However, true story, just heard mm -hmm. two days ago from a lady, she had a diagnostic colonoscopy. Through her insurance, she ended up paying $3,000 because that was her deductible. If she paid cash, she would have spent $1,200. Like it was cheaper and more affordable to pay cash that fascinating? than to go use her insurance, which is not, 
And she spent the literally, <laughs> this is probably worst case scenario, I'm not sure every insurance company is like this or like hospitals yeah. like this. She spent eight hours, she checked in at 6 a.m. She didn't get the procedure done until 6 p.m. that night. When she paid cash, she got in, had a 90-minute visit and, and procedure, left, had, and it was $1,200. It was half the price. She had better service, and she left there. So it's like insurance doesn't guarantee care or that you're going to spend less. It yeah. just... I find it ironic, and I will digress here for a moment, that one of the, the most lucrative, best-performing areas of medicine is elective medicine like cosmetic surgery. Sure. And there's no insurance world for that. Sure. People just, you know, they, they yeah. pay for it and mm -hmm. they do it. And it's a free market and, you know, providers, I would say in that scenario, and I'd be eager to get your point of view on this, but the providers have much more information sharing in the, the crowd world. You yeah. know, there's people say, you know, whether they, they've got some sort of, you know, a breast augmentation or something else sure. out there. Yeah. Um, that they can share how well their experience went rather than like the traditional medicine route, which we've got HIPAA laid over everything, which, yeah. you know, I, I get it, it's important, sure. but it, it impacts people's ability to choose a provider because maybe somebody said, you know, I really had a horrible time with the, this person, their bedside manner, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But there's not a good way to share all of that mm -hmm. information. And I think with elective medicine, where you've got the market, mm -hmm. people are like digging into it. They, do, sure. do they do a good job? Do they do you know what they say they're going to yeah. do? Do they have a great reputation or not? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just kind of curious. Like, I think that is interesting. And yeah. you know, that, that, that there's this other model that's simultaneously going on in the medical industry. Mm -hmm. Not to say it's perfect, but it has a lot of things that the regular medical industry doesn't have, and it's, mm -hmm. I just find that fascinating. What, what's your yeah. take on it? Well, it's interesting you're saying, because we, we're, you know, like there's an executive order passed in what May or something like that, and it's talking about price, price transparency and hospitals have to post pricing. Yeah. And uh, I've never really thought that w hidden within that uh, curtain of pricing, right? Not really knowing what I'm being billed for these services, because it's going to take three to six months before yeah. I really get a bill anyway. Yeah is also um, kind of protection um, uh, for that curtain. That curtain provides kind of a, con I want to say consumer, I guess like a company protection. Whereas when you unveil that, right, when my prices are transparent, they're right on the website, they can go to another direct primary care clinic, they can see their prices, yeah. our services are listed, this, the, their services are listed. It's just completely transparent. And now, so now you know what I'm getting for the services. And we are absolutely accountable to our members because they are the payer. It's not an insurance company. It's not about checking boxes. Yeah. It's either I got to provide high quality care and and be and not be a jerk, or right. or they're going to leave. Right? It's their right. Well, to and then you know we, we're we're here at Ben and Sway to talk about also social media. Yeah. I mean that is another avenue where people like you've got to be mindful mm -hmm. of the fact that they could go share it with a thousand people in 10 <laughs> minutes. Sure. And, and, I, and yeah. I don't mean that that's what makes your decision, but I think yeah. it's one of those things where it's like, uh, to turn around, if you are focused on excellent care and really answering the needs of a patient, mm -hmm. which I would argue at traditional clinics isn't always met, yeah, sure. administratively or uh, practicing. Yeah. Um, but if you do that, you can get rewarded as well because people say, you know, it's such a breath of fresh air. I went and met with Matt. He's just, you know, did all these things, and yeah. it was, he spent a lot of time with me, and we really worked out what, ha what's going on with me, and it wasn't what I thought it was. Sure. You know, those things I think are are powerful, and I'm hopeful that in this world of crowd sharing and you know Yelp and all these other things out there yeah. where people can really talk about their experiences, good and bad, yeah. that people take notice of that and start taking another step towards quality performance when sure. they're in whatever field they're in. But in medical, it just seems like there's, you just said curtain, and that's yeah. what made me think about that. Yeah. I also wonder too, um, about your $3,000 and $1,200 example, mm -hmm. do you think the $3,000 price, do you think there's a chance that provider got less than $1,200 when it was all said and done? Oh, I'm, I'm certain they got less than. So isn't yeah. that that's part of the issue, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, yeah. And I think I brought up earlier, like there the was the provider a, themselves, anyway. Yeah. yeah. The hospital is probably getting three thousand or whatever, but yeah, not the provider. No. Yeah. So yeah. the provider can actually 
potentially in a better marketplace mm -hmm. provide a cash price to a patient yeah. where their yields higher but the patient pays significantly less in this case almost one third of the sure. price that they would have paid with insurance not to the provider right there's a there's a big problem there yeah and yeah, I, I think the I think per provider in a normal family practice clinic which I'm more familiar with there, there usually is one and a half to two nurses, a front office person answering phone calls, and some sort of referral specialist and billing person. That's like what, five, six people yeah. in Australia lose count. Yeah. There, that is a ton of overhead that you're having to pay for in order to justify the 10 minute visits. And so now you've got to really ramp through people, right? So you shorten the visit time. And how much of that is required to deal with insurance bills? Oh, most of it is exactly. that prior authorizations on the phones with the nurses. I mean, they're spending half their day doing that. Ask any nurse, yeah. they're spending half their day doing that. Referral specialists, do we meet the requirements? The billing specialists, I mean, that's what they do is say, did you check the right boxes? The provider themselves are spending two hours documenting for every one hour patient time. How does that make sense? I went how, to school to document. No, yeah. I, I didn't how do that. How could I mean? How much better care could we get in the United States if there was no administrative burden on mm -hmm. the providers? Well, I'll tell you, it would be clinic, unbelievable. So, who when somebody comes in, I see them at the door and say hi. But some administrative person would say hi. The provider is the one that takes them back, does the vitals, does their checks their weight, does their health history, makes a ton of sense, does their physical exam, draws their blood, follows up with the lab results. When they call in, they're talking to the provider directly. It's like we, you just, we just lined up the system, cut out the middle person, and in family practice where this really can work, where now we're aligning the relationships, right? Now it's about a provider and a patient, and it's not about provider and what the insurance says and all the requirements to receive billing, right? Because we're always accountable to the payer. It's like now it's between a patient and a provider, and it's simple. So I was asking you earlier about you know what happens beyond that with insurance, and I was more thinking in terms of you do your your primary care and then you have a specialist sure. and then that let's say we'll, we'll not worry about how much insurance impacts the cost but okay. let's just say it's tremendous yes. let's say it's let's say it's a, a heart surgery or something and then you got a hospital stay so you're fifty eighty thousand yeah, dollars right sure. not many people can cover that cash wise <laughs> even if it was thirty sure. percent less sure yeah uh, so I see other insurance models and I go we've got some images that kind of go this way yeah. the way we're doing medical insurance without direct, direct primary care sure um, it's almost like we're taking our insurance card let's say let's use vehicles for example yeah and we're going to the gas pump to pay for the gas mm -hmm. we're using our insurance to pay for the oil changes yeah. we're using our insurance to pay for maybe even cleaning out our car sure yeah that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. No. I mean, why wouldn't our insurance process is we pay every month in the event that we do something that's beyond what we can pay. Mm -hmm. That's what insurance is, homeowner's right. insurance, what yes, have you. It protects us. And it's more idea. of a market, right? That, mm -hmm. And I think that that's the difference is that there's been some things over time that's created this um, provider insurance consortium that has just been difficult. Yeah. And then the patient's over here. And really, the, the provider and the patient are the ones that really need to do the interaction because that's sure. where the value exchange is. Yeah. And then you have this insurance company. I don't fault the insurance company. They're developing in, a, in the, in the uh, environment that's been created for them. Yes. Yeah. But one of the examples I brought up earlier, which really blew my mind, is there was a data breach. Uh, I think it was a year or two ago, and it, I think it was with Primera. And uh, they, they took it very serious. And they announced that they were going to spend a billion dollars on cybersecurity and protecting patient information. Mm -hmm. And they did it as if this is this great PR thing. And immediately, my thought is, <laughs> there's a billion dollars and we got a healthcare crisis going to nothing sure. that has to do with yeah. patient care. Yeah. And I just think that's a microcosm of multiple things that have mm -hmm. gone on that I'm super grateful that we have the environment, and I hope that legally it doesn't change, yeah. to where you can provide this direct primary care kind of service. Sure. Because as, a, as an employer, you know, and, and somebody that wants access to health, and not just, a, a, just medical, but really having a relationship with a provider right. that can say, hey, you know what? You're, you're getting a little too overweight. What's going on in your life? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you, you've got this hip thing. 
you know, you're packing around 80 pounds too much. Mm -hmm. That might be what's going on here. Instead of going, ooh, hip, MRI, mm -hmm. you know, and just going down that path. Yeah. I, I just, you know, and I'm no expert in this. I'm a business guy, but I've been part of um, associations that have had healthcare and healthcare insurance yeah. and worked with providers and worked with insurance providers. Um, all are trying to do a good job. I think we yeah. need to do some of these really common sense things so people can actually provide the service that they set out to and right. not do all this administrative stuff. Right. Because you know, the, people are going into the medical field for nothing to do with medical because there's all this space in between the provider and the patient. Yeah. And so I want to applaud you for getting out there and doing it. And I see a movement that way. And, sure. I, and I think it's great. I think there's, um, I would say, and, and we haven't talked about this, but I would say there's an opportunity in what I would call industrial medicine where instead of employee employers providing healthcare benefits to their employees and just going out there and talking with insurance providers and going, okay, what's the best deal? Yeah. And what's the, uh, what's the copay and what's the deductible and you know, what are the right. limits? Oh, it's, it's like, uh, I mean, I'm pretty, I think I'm fairly smart, yeah. I mean, but it is a lot, right? <laughs> yeah. Co it has nothing to do with yeah. making timber or media. It yeah. has to do with something completely different. Yeah, so, that's right. And you're putting a lot of stress on people that are trying to make good decisions for employees. Mm -hmm. And so if we had a way to do direct primary care mm -hmm. in, in an employer setting where they could sponsor the system and you, you, you and your family go and set it up, right. that, that, that seems like there's an opportunity to get a lot of business and patients for a firm like yours. Yeah. Um, while providing a, a service that genuinely a business wants to provide right, for, their, for their people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we've got health savings accounts. We've got high deductible uh, health care coverage. I start to see these things come together. I go, man, there's something close here where if you, could, if you could have, instead of me paying $500 a month to every employee towards their, their, their health care, right. if I could pay you know, a hundred dollars a month or whatever it is to a firm like yours, mm -hmm. give them that direct primary care. Mm -hmm. um, and then I could put a couple hundred dollars a month into a health savings account. Yeah. And then put a hundred dollars into an extreme, you know, disaster, catastrophic, catastrophic sure. plan. Yeah. <laughs> then all of a sudden we're benefiting the people that need it most. Right. We're rewarding good um, uh, providers, yeah. and we're covering that catastrophic event that hopefully no one needs. And I think if we do that properly, and I'd like your take on this, don't you think that by providing better primary care, we're going to have less catastrophic incidents on the other end? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's and the research plays out with that. I mean, we've we've known for over a decade now since. It, as long as we have called family medicine and specialty and, and focus on preventative care, we have known that that is how you prevent major expenses down the road. If you yeah. prioritize family practice and preventative care, costs, uh, medical costs will substantially decrease because people will be using those services less. Yeah. And um, when you allow family practice to be all that it can be in the Army, it sounds like that, yeah. be all that it can be, yeah. uh, what what they're in these relations you're, you're talking about where there's industrial there's companies whether they're 500 or 100 or 50 mm -hmm. they're purchasing this they are seeing that their expenses are going down by at least 30 percent and now there's some insurance companies that are starting to get smart and they're seeing that they're saying hey wait these people are filing filing less claims because it's direct primary care right. i never file a claim to an insurance company we gobble it all up we provide high quality care and we keep people out of urgent care in er yeah and surgeries go down, hospitalizations go down. Like there's a lot of major bucks that direct primary care is saving. Yeah. So there's some insurance companies here in Spokane and Washington that have caught wind of that and they're saying, okay, we're gonna develop a product that actually is gonna help cover that major medical and when you pair it with direct primary care, we're gonna add an incentive. So, so employer pays for two, we will give them up to 40% of their premium back at the end of the year so long as they had a relatively healthy year. Yeah. Like, what other insurance company is saying, we'll give you 40% of your premium back? It's not, usually they're it like, It makes too much you. sense, Matt. You know? <laughs> to I mean, do I, something like that. Yeah. No, it's, it's yeah. so good. I mean, yeah. I think that, um, you know, we've, I remember growing up, before I got into the business, so I was in high school. Yeah. Uh, the mentality was just starting to shift, but it was, 
go get a great job with full benefits. Yeah. And you know, people say, "Oh, you got benefits? Just go to the doctor." You know, no, no, that, yeah. Just, just go, and and who cares? It didn't cost anything then. Yeah, yeah and then, then all of a sudden, you know, thirty percent increase year over year over year. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, these things are like out of control, and provide yeah. and and um, employers and, and and the patients didn't know this was going on. Mm. Employers are like, "We need patients. We need our employees." To contribute part of this, yeah, and there was major pushback in the beginning. But they're sure. like, "Hey, we started out paying like hundred and thirty dollars a month for insurance, and yeah. you got great coverage, and you never had to pay anything else. There was no deductible, there was no nothing, no yeah. copay, no nothing. For sure, and it created this environment that just has, I think, gotten out of control. And yeah. it's really great to see that people are looking at that problem and they're seeing a solution. You know, and that's the ultimately what we do in business too. Is there's a, something that needs to be solved. And, and you're doing it, and I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear about how this is working, and I know yeah, that people around Spokane are, uh, that are gonna hear this are probably uh, very interested. How can they learn more about you and direct primary care? Yeah. Well, I'd love to personally you know, sit down with them or talk to them on the phone. They also can go to our website at mydpcclinic.com. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're an employer group, they can click on an employer tab and kind of see kind of the common options for them. Uh, and if they need any help, I, I can walk them through it. If they want to talk about insurance products, we have uh, insurance agents that are very familiar with direct primary care and that uh, cool. product that you can compare, you can pair and get 40% of your premium back. And so we'd be happy just to make some introductions and if it works for them, um, great. Yeah. That's great. I, I, there's there's one other thing we should talk about before we part ways here. Okay. Um, we're at Ben and Sway. We're on the Ben and Sway show. Yeah. We're talking about media. Mm -hmm. um, how did you find out about this show and being on here? Because sure. we didn't know each other before today. Yeah. Right? Well, uh, I'll answer your question here uh, pretty quick, but um, uh, basically through the power story is kind of how I found you guys. Yeah. So. Bobby Ingram, who's the owner of Indaba Coffee, heard his story and kind of how he started his company. And um, and then I heard he started three businesses. And then from a direct primary care perspective, I know he has a lot of employees and know yeah. that it's hard to find affordable health insurance. So I was kind of reaching out to him and saying, hey, is this a reasonable option you'd like to consider for your employees? And as I was stalking him, uh, I um, came across an interview with him online that was done by Ben and Sway mm -hmm. and began to see uh, the Awakening Your Passion series and saw how well you tell story, you know, and it really, um, what I find, I don't know if it's like a millennial thing or something, but is I'm driven in to an, in a person's story more than um, what their product is necessarily, yeah. right? You know, and maybe I'm a sucker for that, but. I think it's but, human nature. It goes back, it, yeah. it goes way back because, you know, before books and the written word, mm -hmm. how do we communicate with story? Sure. You know, yeah. and they went generation, generation. I yeah. think that that's, I don't think we've lost that. Mm -hmm. I think now we've got new tools to tell those stories and yeah. video is just so powerful. Mm -hmm. And then audio too, um, you know, this show is both a podcast and a video uh, series, and so if you can watch it on video, great. But the nice thing about audio that's so cool is it's, uh, and Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this, but it's it's passive engagement. So you okay. can go to the gym, oh, or sure. you can go, you know, do whatever, mm -hmm. and you can listen to a podcast, and you can learn and improve yourself mm -hmm. um, while you're also improving maybe your health. Yeah, sure. So that's a, that's a cool thing, and so I think that, um, you're not a sucker for stories, even though you could be. But I mean, in general, <laughs> yeah, sure. I think we all yeah. love a good story. Yeah. In business, is about interacting with people. Um, yours is absolutely about mm -hmm. interacting with people. Mm -hmm. Less business, more. I mean, I can feel the passion from you mm -hmm. in terms of wanting to do great by others, based on your expertise and and your chosen career path. Yeah. And that is better told in story than told about how much per month. You pay sure, to the visit. Yeah. Right? Yeah, right? But that's all part of it. But yeah. if we lead with the story, people get comfortable. There's a trust that you're going to do right by me hmm. before we start to do the transaction. That's a really good point. So, yeah. Matt, thanks for coming on today. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and hear your story. Mm -hmm.